and I'm pretending to be a different person with a jacket now. <laughs> and the reason I'm moderating today this session is because um, the person that originally was supposed to moderate had some personal reasons uh, not to be here, so I gladly took up the opportunity. My marketing team said, maybe we should find another moderator. I said, no, 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 I'm going to do it. I want to talk to these guys. So thank you so much, guys, for being here. Um, maybe, first of all, I mean, it's a, it's a very broad, big topic that we're going to cover today, private wealth. Um, and you have no better uh, people to discuss and share insights uh, and thought leadership than the four people here. They all represent different kind of segments of the wealth business. Um, Patricia, obviously. Uh, maybe we can start off, actually, with a brief introduction. Um, should we start from Ed on the other side with... Uh, first of all, let's combine a few things in the interest of time, since uh, with soft session we ran out of time pretty quickly. Uh, so we're going to combine the self-intro, a quick intro of your company, and I'll ask each of you to comment on the first question to save time. And that first question is, private wealth management has traditionally been based heavily on trust. And in the past, people have thought that high touch and relationships is what drives engagement with clients. Um, and we're seen as the only way to build trust and service clients properly. In today's world, trust is still paramount, but since this is a wealth tech conference, um, let me ask you, how can the industry tap technology and digital tools to continue building trust and relationships? How is digitalization driving your business's priori business priorities today? Business's priorities today, sorry. So we're going to start with Ed. Self-intro, company intro, and a brief discussion about how your company is tackling this digitalization. Sure. Uh, first, thanks, Sam. I, I've known Sam for too long, 20 long. years plus, uh, and uh, thank him for inviting me today and really to congratulate Sam and Andawas for all that they've achieved so far. So my name is Edward Moon. I head the uh, global wealth business in Asia Pacific for Apollo. We are a premier global alternative asset manager managing $513 billion in AUM, over half a trillion since 1990. Uh, so for 32 years, heading into our 33rd, um, you know, really, quite simply, we provide excess return, or we seek to provide excess return all along the risk return spectrum from safe investment grade all the way up to higher yielding private markets or private equity. And for us, you know, this is a forum that probably five years ago Apollo would not have attended. So. You know, just to really uh, paint the landscape of how the landscape has changed, you know, Apollo was typically investing, in, in many ways, indirectly for a lot of private wealth clients through uh, the, you know, we count amongst our LPs, so the largest sovereign wealth funds, endowments, pension funds in the world. Today, you know, we see the tremendous growth in uh, the private wealth space, number one. Uh, number two, products that we are bringing to market are really tailor-made for the private wealth um, segment. And in the intersection of that is really where Endowa sits. That is, we feel that the, there are secular forces that are tremendous tailwinds for where we sit today, which is the democratization of finance and creating fi frictionless kind of um, ability for us to bring our products and service a wider range of clients. On that front, Apollo has been on the front edge. We have invested um, and tried to future-proof our business. We've made investments um, with iCapital. We've made investments in figure and motive. Uh, these are blockchain technologies, not to really try to pick uh, and choose the, the winners or losers of that space in particular asset classes, but we understand that the transformational um, way that fintech is going to really change the way that uh, financial products are consumed going forward, um, we want to play a, a leading role in, in that front. So that's the first kind of introduction of what we do, and we look forward to working closely with Endowis and your partners um, going forward as well as we serve our clients. Thank you so much, Ed. Masia. Great, thank you. Thank you for having us, and, and congrats on all the great milestone and that have been achieving. It has been great to be with you guys since the beginning, so very happy to be here today. Um, my name is Marcio Bogorisin. I had uh, Asia Wealth Management X-Japan for PIMCO 
For those who don't know us, PIMCO, we're the largest active fixed income manager in the world. And when I say fixed income, really from the private to the public spectrum. Going to your question, uh, we think relationship and trust is very important uh, for the wealth business. Uh, the way we think about it is you know, how digital tools or technology can help enhance that trust and that relationship. Uh, so in a recent study, uh, EY study, it said that 30% of clients will be moving their assets to another provider in the near future because they feel that the current provider, they don't understand their objectives and goals. Right, so how can we think about technology to help enhance that trust and relationship? If you had a tool, and back to the, the fireside chat, if you had a tool where you could put together a portfolio, you could stress that the portfolio, you could go into the risk factors of that portfolio to really see if you're gonna meet the client's objective, we think that would, that would actually enhance that relationship and enhance trust. Uh, so that's how we think, you know, digital tools could help with relationship. From our side, you know, just some stats. Uh, one, about one in four employees at PIMCO work in technology. Wow. Uh, we have been investing this year 20% more than we did last year. Uh, so we think about people, platform, and also infrastructure, and also focusing in three areas, which are client servicing or client experience. Uh, the second one is alpha generation, how you can be better investors using technology. And third is really infrastructure and how you bring all of that together. Wonderful, thank you, Marcio. Patricia. Thanks, Sam. Again, thanks for having us, Sam and Dallas, and it's great to see everyone in person. My name is Pat. I head up Singapore, Malaysia for UBS Global Wealth Management. Um, for those of you who don't know UBS, um, we provide financial advice and solutions to individual investors, institutions, as well as corporates across asset management, investment bank, and wealth management. Uh, these boys here, they are partners to us, if I can <laughs> say that. And um, we actually operate, um, we're quite global. So we manage about $4 trillion across Americas, Europe, as well as uh, Asia Pacific. And uh, in APEC, we manage about half a billion dollars across Singapore and Hong Kong, which are our two um, booking centers. And on the question of digital, you know, our business wealth management is one which is very high touch, very uh, high level of engagement, and a lot of it is predicated on trust. So nowadays, uh, tech and digital is actually quite critical for us because through tech, we're able to develop what we call multi or omni channels of engagement because next gens, they're not all about touchy feelies, high touch still, but I think our next gen want to interact when they want to interact. So we need to pace ourselves to interact with them whenever they want to. So one of the things we do is, um, for example, uh, family offices, they trade via our uh, high-speed execution platform through what we call PET, and they trade through Bloomberg with us. Uh, for wealth management, we provide digital blank, uh, banking platform where clients can do various different types of trades from FX all the way to funds. And um, I think one of the other things we do is also called My Way. So My Way is a tool that allows investors to select any type of investments they want and build a portfolio which is tailor-made to them. And you might know that UBS Singapore has built what we call Circle One. Circle One is an app, and that's actually uh, something like a Netflix. So you consume information on the go, right? You think about it, for a lot of you who are familiar with wealth management business, you've always received research write-ups from your banks, right? How, how does it come? So in the old days, the research write-up will come via fax machines in the really, really old days. And then your research materials get sent via emails. And recently, it gets sent via mobile app. So what this tries to do is it's videos. You just watch videos on the go. So back to you, Sam. Basically, I think there's a lot of needs that um, we can address via digital tools now. And pandemic has really accelerated the whole adoption. Thank you, Pat. OK, Joel. 
Thanks, Sam. Wonderful to be here. Uh, so my name is Joel Teasdell. I'm the head of Wealth Management Group for Dimensional in Asia X Japan. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Dimensional Fund Advisors is, we are one of the world's best kept secrets in terms of large <laughs> asset managers. I think we manage a give or take where markets are at today. I'm not sure, probably about 700 billion US dollars. Um, we're a privately owned firm uh, based in the United States and we have a 35 person office here in Singapore, uh, have had for 10 years. Uh, and our investment approach, well, we describe it as um, low cost and highly diversified systematic investing. In years gone by, it used to be factor-based investing. Before that, it was, you know, the people who started the firm, you know, pioneered the, world, the world's first index funds in 1971. So we, we know quite a lot about you know, running money systematically in a, in a low cost way, um, which has always been heavily dependent on good technology. Mm. Um, and so I guess the partnership that we've had with Endow Us, which has been tremendous, and I think this forum has been a long time coming, where we can talk about you know, the changes that are happening in the wealth management industry, not only in Singapore, but globally. And, and as the world's third biggest financial centre, Singapore plays a key role. And so our observations are that you know, around the world in the private wealth space, there's been a, you know, a trend for probably 20 or 30 years mm. for people to look for lower cost, more reliable, transparent vehicles for, for investment. And the market is flooded with them. And there's so many ETFs and index funds and other solutions. The challenge has been, I think until recently in the, in the advice space, <coughs> is that everyone's there to sell product and to sell return. You don't do that, mm. right? You have a technology platform that enables advice-led, good, goals-based outcome for clients. Mm. And so for us, the observation and learning is that it's not about the product, it's about the people. Mm -hmm. And how do, you, how do you digitize advice in a scalable way where you can give people great access and more, more personal attention mm -hmm. through a digital way um, to have good investment outcomes through, as you say, financial literacy, through discipline, um, and for understanding how capital markets work. So that's, that's been the big change, I think, happening in Singapore. You're at the forefront of it, and I think there's, there's a lot more traffic to flow that way. Yep, fantastic. Thank you, Joel. Well, amazing answers. These guys came prepared, right? Um, I'm going to turn to Patricia. We're going to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, Patricia, first of all, it's great to have you here, considering Indawas and UBS's special relationship. UBS is a shareholder of Indawas. Um, but we're also, you know, working in partnership and strategically to see how we can work closer together. So thank you for your support. I know that also that you're very particularly passionate about two groups of investors. Um, the first is the rapidly growing, uh, growing family office segment. Um, and we talked about the generational wealth that's happening. Almost, I think, $5 trillion of wealth were transferred to the next generation over the, past, uh, over the next decade. Um, so this new generation investors obviously are, you know, have different investing attitudes uh, compared to their predecessors, want a different experience. Mm -hmm. um, the second group is obviously female investors mm -hmm. um, and their needs. Um, how are these two major segments of the private wealth market uh, doing? What is important <clears throat> to them in your mind? What are you seeing and what, are, what is UBS doing to meet their needs? Wow. There are many Sorry. questions in there. Big, big question. <laughs> yeah, um, but just as an observation, yeah. right? You know, we talk a lot about um, wealth and women as a growing segment, but across the audience here, I think it's only one in four, one in five maybe that are women. Yeah. Very much like what we have on the panel. So that panel, has to change. Yeah. So. <laughs> we, we avoided a manual just about. Thank you, Patricia. So globally, um, I think first I'll start by sharing some of the key trends and then you can see how the products will develop, the solutions will develop. So four in five families, maybe as a show of hands, who are from family offices here? Anyone from family office? Too shy? Okay, shy. you've got a few family offices here. Yep. Thank you. So four in five families say that growing wealth remains their biggest priority. So interest rates, inflation, geopolitical risk, um, higher valuations are key concerns for them right now. And bearing in mind as well, if I look at the people who raise their hands, uh, the new higher interest rate environment 
is a new normal for families who have just invested since the global financial crisis, if you think about it, right? And as a result, family offices at the moment, and I think into the next 12, 24 months, they will review their options and they are looking for uncorrelated returns and more active strategies. At the same time, families are also looking at uh, investing into alternatives such as private equity with the potential for higher returns compared to public equities and add that music to your ears, I'm sure. Broadly speaking, alternatives, alternatives represent about 40% thereabout of family office uh, portfolio with private equity allocations set to rise further into the next five years. Mm. And um, for UBS, these kind of families, we advocate that they think about their investments from an invest, uh, from endowment style portfolio, what we call ESP. And this is basically a call for higher allocation to alternative asset classes that will give you enhanced returns with better adjusted risks over a period of time. And for those of you who may ask, what is alternatives? Because 40% is a fairly large allocation. So alternatives would constitute private equity, uh, private debt, private real estate, direct investment, as well as ventures. And therefore, from, uh, um, from a perspective of wealth tech, actually the democratization of private equity availability right, on fintech platforms like edX, OE is seated right there, certainly adds to the accessibility of such investments for families and women. Now, um, our families are crypto curious, right? Just now we touched about crypto uh, with, the, uh, with the previous speaker. Now, it, we may think that a lot of families are investing large amounts into crypto, but the reality is most families are crypto curious rather than crypto committed. So they are investing in DLTs, blockchains, rather than large amounts into crypto because they are there to learn instead of to earn. So allocation-wise, is still very small. Uh, family office would also want to invest sustainably, with half of them having more sustainable investments in their portfolios. And you can hear from Jessica later uh, that voices of our next-gen investors are getting louder and louder where family investment decisions are concerned. Now, I quickly segue into women, okay? One in two, one in two new wealth owners will be female over the next 10 years. And the CAGA growth of women will grow more than men. So you're looking at ballpark growth of 8% in women wealth versus 5% in men. Um, and in 2016, just to take a step back, right, women control about 30% of wealth, but that will grow to about 50% by 2030. So if you're not catering to women's wealth right now, message is very clear. Mm. Now, 75% uh, of women under the age of 45 are already managing their own money. And I think one of the key things about women is this, okay? Women are interested and they find affinity in investing into areas where they care about. Healthcare, children, education. And one of the key components is women are very tech savvy. So this is where fintech um, will play a very big role in how we develop the family office as, as well as women wealth over the course of the next uh, 10 years. But certainly, one of the key things is also this, that um, you know you often go to conferences or meetings and you see the client. You always think that the client is a mister and the wife is the wife. You never bother to ask about the wife's name, if she has, you know. So I think that dialogue, that narrative <coughs> will have to change. Yeah. Back Thank to you. you. Thank you, Pat. It's encouraging to see that in Dawas actually has almost 50% of our client base and female Thank investors, you. which is fantastic to see. Also, women are, I guess, more driven towards goal-based investing, right? Because yes. they see tangible goals that they strive for. Correct. Yeah. Which brings me and to Joel. And statistically better investors. <laughs> statistically yes. better investors. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, I didn't so say that driven. because there are too many men in the room. <laughs> well, but yes. It's okay to say Can't that. I used to say the that all the time. Statistically sure. proven, yeah. women are better investors. True. Yes. Which leads True. me to Joel, Empirical. and um, I mean to Sop's experience as well. How do we do advice better? How do we do advice better? Yeah. Uh, number one, you get rid of the conflicts of interest in the business model. Yeah. 
I mean, that, that, that game's been changing for 30 plus years around the world. I think sometimes that's regulatory driven, like mm -hmm. you saw in Australia or the Netherlands or the UK. I think sometimes it's market driven. Well, they didn't change the law in the US. Consumers voted with their feet yeah. to, be, to be dealt with by an advice professional in a fiduciary manner rather than be sold to as a broker. So if you look at the amount of money flowing into you know, the wire houses or the banks, in the US 15 years ago versus today, you know, it was minuscule, mm. and now it's probably more than 50%. I don't have seen the latest data, but I think that's the number one. Um, the second thing, and, and the law doesn't have to change. Yep. You just have to let people know you're on the map. I mean, I remember Dimensional for years and years was trying to look for um, entrepreneurs who had a fee-based model, mm. who wanted to do things in their client's best interest, do good and do well, uh, and it just took a long time for that to happen. But over the last decade or so, there's more and more fiduciary-based advisors whom we're huge advocates of because it leads to better advice outcomes. So I think the more um, that you can make people aware that there's an alternative to, you know, to just having an advice relationship where you pay transactionally, mm. um, that's huge. And the other part of it is <coughs> helping people understand how capital markets work and what they are in control of and they're not in control of mm. to be successful. So I think the platform that you have, um, which is goals-based, which is educational, which is transparent, goes a long way to affecting those outcomes. Yeah. Right. The last thing is we need to train many, many more good advisors. And sadly, there's, just, there's not enough probably anywhere in the world, let alone in Singapore. Lots of good salespeople, but from a technical capacity and being able to give holistic advice, yeah. we need more. We need more. Fantastic. Thank you, Joel. Uh, moving on to Marcio. Um, as a fund manager working with partners like UBS, we found out that uh, Pat is actually a very important person on this <laughs> panel for various reasons, but also because we all work with UBS and endow us. Uh, what are your thoughts about the pace of you know, the, the transformation? And especially PIMCO I mean, does a lot of stuff that you said. But in the end, you're an active manager, right? And investors want good returns. So how do you reconcile these two things in generating a, a alpha and better outcomes with the client experience and the role of technology? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I think, as I mentioned before, about one in four PIMCO employees are in technology. So this includes you know, quantitative research, uh, AI machine learning experts, as well as technologists globally. Uh, and you know, our CEO, Manny Roman, he thinks that you cannot never overinvest in technology, and that's why we continue to invest a little bit more every year. Going back to your question, I think there, there are three things that we're doing. The first one is alpha generation. So I'll give you a, an example here. The first one is uh, we have a database of 200 million mortgage loans in the U.S. and borrowers' profile. So we have a tool where we can understand which types of loan will prepay, which types of loan will default, which type of borrow profile might prepay, which type of borrow profile might default. So whenever there's a new issuance or we have a, a new mortgage pool that comes uh, to our desk, we can very easily and effectively know what percent of it might prepay, what percent of it might default, and we can be better investors making better decisions using a tool like that. A second one is, you know, when the Fed used to speak, there will be many people at PIMCO looking at what words that they added, what words that they deleted, is it hawkish, is it bearish? And now there's an AI machine learning tool that we use that we put the Fed speech into it and it will tell us what words were added, what words were deleted, what sentences were bearish, what sentence was more bullish or dovish or hawkish. So these are things that it will help us be better investors. They're not making the decision for us, but it will help our PMs make better decisions. So that's on the alpha generation side. And the client experience side, um, we're launching uh, a tool called PIMCO Pro uh, here in Asia. We have this tool in, in the US. And this is really getting our in-house analytics that we used to, to utilize for our institutional clients and put in a web-based ba web application where our clients can go in, they can build a portfolio using PIMCO funds, third-party funds, ETF, they can stress test the portfolio, they can go into risk factor, correlation of the different uh, funds and, and assets. And this is something that the good news is it's free, it's easy to use, and we think that it will really enhance client experience. So if you're an advisor, if you're someone sitting in a home office or a research team, you can really use that as a tool 
uh, and I think we think that will also enhance our client experience. And the last thing is infrastructure, and I think that's maybe the less glamorous part of technology, but how do you bring all of that together? Where do you put your data, how to retrieve your data, how you make your systems uh, to integrate and operate uh, all together, and I think that's another part uh, where we continue to invest. Okay, wonderful, Marcio. Um, uh, lastly, but not least, Edward, um, the topic of alternatives, you just received a wonderful endorsement from Pat um, on that uh, mm -hmm. sector and private markets. Um, and you know, a lot of people may not know, but Indaos obviously also uh, provides access to private markets on alternatives. Uh, ADEX, you know, we have Moonfair, um, B2B players like iCapital and Antarctica, uh, a lot of players in this space. Um, and you know, it's, a, it's a burgeoning space, but very early lack of technology. Um, just wanted to ask you, you, know, you have experience actually on the buy side as well because you were previously at HSBC, head of alts and Bank of Singapore. So you've been on both sides. It's just any major observations about the major trends with regards to this sector that's you know, uh, an exciting sector that uh, everyone's talking about these days? Absolutely. First, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Pat as well. We are very strong partners with UBS um, and, and thank them for their support as well. So first, I'd like to, I, I, when Sam and I sat down and he asked me to sit on this panel, he asked me for one thing, which is to try to demystify alternatives. And if I do one thing today, I hope I'll try to do that, which is what are alternatives? Alternatives is simply the private market's equivalent of all the asset classes that every investor really is familiar with, which is equities, credit, and real assets. And if you take a look at the largest, most sophisticated investors in the world, sovereign wealth funds, endowments, pension funds, insurance companies, they have for decades been um, invested in large numbers, and some of their portfolios are um, 50, 60, 70 percent in alternatives. And so the, what's exciting today is that for the first time, alternatives, that world is opening up to individual investors. So I saw this uh, article last week, the 60-40 traditional portfolio is on pace this year for its worst year since 1936. So 90, almost 90 years. And you know, if you think back, what was the point of a 60-40, so that's 60% public equities and 40% public bonds, is that there was a time when this was less correlated, when stocks were up and bonds were down and vice versa. 2021, the correlation between public market equities and bonds reached nearly 90%. There is no diversification. So if the 60-40 portfolio isn't dead, it's certainly on life support. And it's something that we've been saying for a long time, which is there's very little alpha left in traditional markets. Or to put it another way, in a market where, since the GFC, central banks have really flooded the market with tremendous liquidity in a low interest rate environment has helped buoy traditional assets, that has ended. And we are now seeing a rising rate environment that's very, very challenging for investors, whether you're looking for traditional return on equities, which is still fairly highly valued, and then for income-related strategies as well. So how, how do you solve that challenge? Well. Private markets is one way that we believe to be a robust area where there's, number one, very low penetration by traditional um, private individuals. And today we have products now that we're bringing to market through our partners to be able to deliver these solutions as well. The other point I would make is that if you wanted a large diversified um, exposure to public markets in the US, you would invest in something called the Wilshire, Wilshire 5000 Index. This is the total market cap of all the publicly available traded stocks in the US. It's called Wilshire 5000 because there used to be 5,000 publicly listed companies. Mm -hmm. Today, it has about 3,500. The number of listed companies has gone down over the decades mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. Um, there's been acquisitions, companies are going private, Companies that are staying private are staying private for longer. The most dynamic companies, such as Endowis, these are private companies. How do you get exposure to these, these, um, these companies? One of the ways to do that is really to invest in experts that have been investing in decades and delivering returns at top decile, top quartile returns. That's the real tr trick and the challenge. When you are investing in private markets, 
You want to invest with the best and that have been doing it for decades. And we believe that, again, we provide a tremendous opportunity to marry those uh, solutions to clients that are looking to you know, really uh, achieve better outcomes for their portfolios going forward. Thank you, Ed. Uh, in the interest of time, we're actually running out of time. So quick fire question. Does uh, alternative still make sense net of all the fees? Absolutely. OK, done. OK, we move on. <laughs> Joel. Fees are a good question. Current, a current, of, yeah, current wealth industry in Asia is sales-based advisor. What, what will it take to pivot to advisory-based sales? Or advise, advice? I don't know. Does that make sense? Advisory-based well, sales? Can, can, I just, can I just supplement my, my answer really, really quickly? Very quickly. Very quickly. Two seconds. So I, as you know, I moved from Hong Kong to Singapore, back to Hong Kong. I, I returned back to Singapore. And I had my, what is the equivalent of the CPF in Hong Kong, which I could have cashed out as I'm permanently leaving Hong Kong. I've left it because it's a passive investment. I'm down in that. And there's no reason why I don't need the money right now, so I'll just leave it. Mm -hmm. I would have been much better off had I invested in our own products or alternative products in the end. <laughs> Another plug. Okay, go, Joel. <laughs> Quickly. Advisory-based sales, how do we achieve? How do we achieve it? I yeah, think we need more, we need more entrepreneurs yeah. to do what you have done and provide an opportunity for investors to get advice another way, which is to pay for it as like a professional service, as, uh, as you would an accountant or a lawyer or anything else. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. And the second thing is we need to have put investment solutions on the table that can actually achieve goals-based advice because far too many people just don't even get the return of the market and they don't know they're entitled to it. Okay. So you need to put a light on that. Okay. Anything to add or quick five questions on Pat Masio, is ESG real, investing real? Yes. Set, set up the next panel. <laughs> yes. Yes, okay. it's real. I mean, for us, we, we respect the clients, right? There are some clients that like ESG, and, and for clients that like ESG, we have ESG funds for them, and clients that ESG might not be their biggest priorities, we also have funds that do not have ESG tilt. Uh, in general, we do have an ESG framework into our investment process, but I think we need to respect the client that some clients want ESG and some other clients don't want ESG, and, and I think mm. we have to cater for both. And when Pat said yes and she smiled, it means she's seen massive inflows into ESG products, mm -hmm. is that? Yeah, so I think from an investment standpoint, we started maybe um, three, four years ago with what we call the SI mandates. Mm -hmm. That was about a billion inflow in the first year. In the last three years, we are now at about $5.4 billion. So I think there's a lot of um, interest and demand going in and this is particularly for families where we see the younger generation coming in because that's what they are asking for. And it's true that for some of our clients, right, like you said, um, they don't think it's important, but I think more and more the writing is on the wall. We will get there sooner or later. Okay, with that, thank you so much, Joel, Pat, Marcio, Ed. Wonderful to do this panel with you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.